Postgres, the 40-year-old open source, the Toyota of databases, powers pretty much every major platform you know. It's the number one choice for most companies because it's battle-tested, fast, comes with great power, and with that comes great responsibility. But this doesn't even begin to tell the Postgres story. It's not for nothing that it keeps getting the gold medal for most loved database after dethroning the Swedish database MySQL, sending it to Valhalla. It supports custom objects, unstructured data, can replace Redis, Elasticsearch, RabbitMQ, MongoDB, Kafka, and even your REST API server. For all of these and more, Postgres is beyond just a database. It's kind of like an operating system, a full-blown backend stack of its own. And that's not all. This extremely reliable beast of a database just got better a couple weeks back with a major upgrade making it even more than twice as fast. This was a lot. Let's rewind a little. PostgreSQL, aka Postgres or just PG, is an open source database working in a client server architecture, unlike my beloved SQLite, which I covered in the video above. Postgres focuses on performance and extensibility. This means you can extend it, and my god, people have. We'll get there. Born in Berkeley, California in 1985, a successor to the Ingress database had won its author a Turing Award some 30 years later. Michael Stonebreaker, yes, that's a hard name to ignore, wanted to improve Ingress, which he had previously created and named it Post Ingress, which morphed into what we all know today. Its secret sauce lies with something the PG team calls multi-version concurrency control, which essentially means every transaction gets a data snapshot, allowing extremely efficient concurrency. This has its drawbacks, especially with high write-ops as one can imagine, but luckily Postgres is extremely tweakable, sometimes to an extent you didn't quite expect. I decided someone needed the try to create a Postgres configuration optimized to process queries as slow as possible. Why? I'm not sure. So today we're going in from setup through the basics making it the king of databases to extending it so that it becomes the everything stack, a system that's capable of every function and the reason you may too build your next project with or on Postgres. Let's go. This one took a lot of research, so a shot of espresso is advised, and with that in the veins, let's look at Postgres, the world's most advanced open source relational database. At least that's their claim. Who is there? Well, the team is comprised of a core group and many, many contributors with no formal list of features. We enjoy allowing devs to explore the topics of their own choosing. I'd love to work there. Back to the team. Well, the last time they took a photo was 2006, and that was a long time ago. Nevertheless, behold, the Postgres team. So, back to our point, looking at the different dev groups in PG can tell you a lot about what's going on, but we're here to get our hands dirty. Pick your favorite package manager. I'm on a Mac, so brew install PostgreSQL and you've got psql ready to fire up the default database with the very original name Postgres. By the way, running psql and a DB name is equivalent to running the full command psql with localhost, the host, the default port, 5432, my computer's username as a login and the database name Postgres. A few backslash commands for convenience, backslash l lists databases while d and dt help us when we create some tables. We'll get there in a sec, but before that, how about we upgrade our terminal life with some sweet syntax highlighting and auto-completion? PGCLI is a super popular choice over PSQL and what I'll be using from now on. Now we're talking, a list of options, colors, descriptions, like it should be. One tip, just like shell commands in Vim, PGCLI and PSQL take exclamation mark after backslash, sending it to the shell. So to clear the screen, we can run that and voila, backslash Q, quits, that's fairly straightforward. So let's get to some interesting bits. One of PG's biggest selling points are composite types, which basically mean you can configure a special class with custom fields. Why do that? Well, while you could obviously configure that in your code and then separate them into columns, consider what I just said. First, there's no need to separate the columns, and a composite type takes one column but can still be sliced and diced later. But beyond that, imagine the level of safety you're getting by forcing the structure of data coming into your type. Let's see an example to make things clear. I'll create a type called address, which will hold two fields a street and a city, both text fields. Next, we create a table called customers, which will hold a simple name, but also a ship to column of type address. Starting to get the idea? Now D will show us the schema of the table and again our address as a type of the field. Let's use it. When you're running a database in a home lab, storage is everything. You need space for your databases, your backups, the whole deal. 
That's why I'm so happy with the Ugreen DXP 4800 Plus, our sponsor for today's video, which have kindly sent it over. With support for up to 136 terabytes across its four bays, I finally freed up all the space I need, ensuring I never worry about my database or backups ever again. And to keep those databases running smoothly, this NAS is powered by a 12th gen 5 core Intel processor. This means it's snappy and responsive and is crucial for handling large queries and data operations. Plus, with transfer speeds reaching up to 1000 1250 megabytes per second, moving massive database files or backups is incredibly fast. Now, for those of you who follow the channel, you know how much I rely on Docker for deploying applications and expanding my home lab capabilities. The Ugreen NAS integrates perfectly with Docker, making it even easier to deploy and manage stateful applications and other tools. Setting it all up was surprisingly straightforward. Even though it's a powerful machine, the OS is a breeze to navigate. Installing the hard drive requires pretty much nothing. You just slide them in and the system's step-by-step -step guidance makes configuration configuration painless. It's become my go-to for multi-device personal cloud. I can access all of my files from my phone, my laptop, anywhere. So if you're looking for a robust, fast, and secure storage solution for your own personal cloud, the Ugreen NAS series is now available on Amazon and the Ugreen official website. Check out the links in the description to learn more. Now back to the video. We'll insert a dear friend called Homer Simpson. To write his address, we're using the row function and this is just for visibility. Holding the fields by order street and then city name. Like I said, we can drop the row function and insert Marge. This time without it, still works. Selecting our users shows a composite struct under ship2. Let's select a nested field. This is done using the parenthesis and a dot notation followed by the nested field. I'll select city and there you have it. Name and city as if it was a column of its own. Naturally, you can add a WHERE clause and play with it as well. Picking any other field works exactly the same. You can also pick both and create a snapshot result of the different fields separated to their matching columns, allowing for a wide range of SQL queries so that you don't lose any functionality by using these. While nested fields are great, sometimes you'd rather store documents. For that, you can use Mongo. I'm joking. You can store JSONs in Postgres. Yeah, yeah, I know what the NoSQL fans are thinking. Yes, you don't get the exact same performance, but it's very much doable. Not only doable, there's an actual type that parses inserted JSON and lets you query unstructured nested fields. Check this out. This time, our table is called users. We'll give them a primary key, serial ID, a name that cannot be null, and a profile holding the type JSONB, which is a JSON PG takes and parses. You can absolutely store standard JSONs, which which will be stored as text. JSONB is stored as a decomposed binary, which while being slower to process is indexed and queryable. Here's our users table schema. Let's see how it works. We insert into users name and profile and the value for profile holds just a JSON text. Note I added age as int, expecting the parser to recognize it alone. Now querying is a bit different. You might think like me that using the previous trick with the composite types and a dot notation will work, but that's not the case and we're told that this doesn't apply to JSONB. So here's the trick. Select from users where profile and the operator dash and a double greater than sign. This is not your standard error and every app that supports nerd fonts makes it super hard to show. So for the real combo of characters, we'll use a browser to the rescue and this is what's expected. Now, let's find users where the city key in profile is Springfield. And there we have it. Adding a bunch of family members to the Simpson home to show another operator. The at sign lets you send a raw key value to find profile like so. If you only care about the existence of a key, question mark takes any key and returns a list of entries that have it. Remember, this is unstructured data, and we do have one family member that has interests instead of occupation. As with NoSQL, there's no forcing a schema here, and we shouldn't expect it, which makes the question mark operator extremely useful. By the way, you can also update unstructured data. It's usually a bad idea because it's risky and probably a sign you should be using another type. Nevertheless, to do that, use the JSONB set function, taking the profile and the updated value casted to JSONB. See Homer just turned 20 at the end of the list? So far, great features, but the next one is the secret sauce behind PG's performance and why it's so widely used. Multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC in short, means that every transaction gets a snapshot of the data, making it extremely performant by preventing traffic jams with incoming transactions. To see how it works, we'll use a common SQL pair. The begin and commit commands are starting and ending a query. Usually, this is done for you behind the scenes. Just to make sure it works, we can hit begin again, and PG tells us the transaction is 
already in progress in this session. Let's select all entries from users. Now in the other shell, we'll also begin a query and update Homer's last name to Gimson. Once run successfully, let's pick the data again on the top split where Homer's last name is still intact. However, below, since we haven't yet committed the change, the last name is different. Again, same database, same table, only when we create a transaction, we're using a snapshot of the data. This way, write doesn't block read operations. What if we tried writing in both sessions at the same time? Well, we still have the bottom split uncommitted, which means there's a write operation going on. Let's update back Homer Simpson on top. When approving, you'll note that the session hangs. Nothing comes back. This is due to two write commands going on at the same time, which in this case is blocking. If we commit the blocking write session below, we expect to see both released. We'll use a small tmax trick to select both tables in two splits at the same time. There's still a difference due to the fact that we've only committed the lower split with the Gimson update. We'll commit again, select all again on both sessions and both back to Simpson. Now, what if we're in the middle of an update transaction, not yet committed and we decide to drop the changes. Instead of committing, we can roll back to restore the data. This is a great way to ensure data manipulation on the fly without risk. Use begin and commit or roll back to dry run the changes on a snapshot rather than the database itself and make sure it was successful before sending it through. This explains performance and cool basic features, but one of Postgres biggest selling points is its extensibility. It can quite literally replace most of your backend stack. From message queues and cache systems through text search, PubSub, job queues, and cron jobs. All of these are done using extensions. Some of these are so powerful, they're a Postgres extension which is known as a full-blown product on their own. First up, cache. Let's replace Redis with Postgres, shall we? To implement cache in Postgres effectively, we will use analog tables. How are these different from normal tables? Unlog tables don't generate wall, write ahead log. If you're curious about wall, I explained it on the SQLite video up here. There's obviously a trade-off. Unlog tables aren't crash safe without wall record. If a database server crashes, an unlog table is automatically truncated. But with cache, we don't really expect proper persistence, so that's okay. Optionally, we also create an index for better read performance. Now, this is the juice. We create a cache expiry procedure called expire rows, which deletes from the cache cache table where the age of an entry is larger than the retention period, basically a TTL. Next, we call this procedure sending it 60 minutes as a retention period, effectively creating an automated cache with time to live on every object. The one piece left is to automate the call on a schedule. For that, we'll use an extension called pgcron, which is extremely popular and allows for any cron job to run on your database. From maintenance to custom procedures like this one, cron makes your database a small operating system. If you're running on raw DB without the extension, you may have to add it yourself like me. And this may include getting the postgresql.conf file, which is available to you from the DB by running show config underscore file. You'll then want to add pgcron to the preloaded libraries on the bottom of the file. Once that's ready, a quick service restart to pg and create the extension says we're good to go. Automating is fairly straightforward. We select a cron.schedule, then add the cron setup. In this instance, running every hour calling expire underscore rows procedure. That's it. You can always query cron.job to view the task schedule and other details. And there we have an expiry on our cache. Now, Redis, which we've just arguably replaced, is also famous for allowing PubSub message patterns. You know, publish messages to a queue and then have subscribers reading from it, often used for in-app notifications and real-time needs. Well, PubSub is easily implemented in Postgres. Yes, there's an extension for that, but we can also implement it raw. We create a simple table called jobs with an ID, a task name, and whether it has been processed or not to keep track. If this brings up something like celery to mind, you're absolutely right. Now, jobs table is ready, time to test it. On the first session on top, I'll listen to incoming messages by mentioning the new jobs channel. On the other session, I'll write a new job to the table and then notify new jobs channel. Now, refreshing the top with a dummy command and there's our message, notification received on channel holding new job one. We can send and receive multiple messages for processing. It doesn't have to be one at a time. Just to clarify, in a real world application, the listener is constantly refreshed and pops the new message instantly. Also, the extension, which in this case we didn't use, can help with a lot of the heavy lifting and not to keep the job queue starving. 
Speaking of queues, let's implement a RabbitMQ replacement, because Postgres is also great for queues. PGMQ is a popular extension which implements a lightweight message queue which has API parity with AWS SQS. This makes it great as a starting point and later easy to port to something else. To install it, this time I used PGXN which helps us install PG extensions. Run PGXN install PGMQ and once it's ready, back to the database, create extension PGMQ and we're ready. To start, we create a queue with pgmq.create. Once ready, we can run pgmq send with a queue name and the message itself. Want to read? You guessed it. pgmq.read with a queue name, visibility time, which specifies the duration of time in seconds that the message is invisible, giving you time to process and prevents waste. Quantity is the number of messages you'd like to read and defaults to one. Note that reading again before 30 seconds have passed shows an empty queue. If we send again, there are three messages, but only one visible at this time. To avoid specifying visibility, you can pop messages, which instantly deletes them from the queue. In some cases, this may be risky as a crash service can lose the message, which will never be queued again, so use with caution. We can keep popping from the table until it's empty like so. Messages can be archived, making sure that they're not processed but also not deleted. When you do want to delete, just name the queue an ID, which is useful after successfully processing before the visibility time runs out. So you have a database that's also a cache server, a pop sub system with channels and a message broker all in one. But it doesn't stop there. You can extend Postgres with so many more options. A crazy one is an extension called PostGIS, made to store, index and query geospatial data. I'm totally serious. You can create a table with geography as a location type, index them, then insert coordinates like a list of coffee shops, which is on the top list of my personal use cases, then select the one that's closest to you by using the distance function that comes with it and there you have it. It doesn't end there. There's Timescale DB, which is an implementation of time series in Postgres and is extremely popular and yes, kind of replaces Elasticsearch. Need a key value store? Use HStore. Working with AI and need a vector database? Sure you are. PG Vector takes care of that. Postgres has a lot more, and while it's a fantastic database, sometimes even that can be an overkill. It's not for nothing that the computer or phone you're using right now is running at least one instance of SQLite, my favorite starter for any side project. Watch this next video to figure out all about it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.